welcome everyone. Um, so that was a spectacular talk by Fernando, so I don't think I can, I, I can be as exciting. But I'll, 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 I'll stay on the algorithmic level, uh, so it's not going to be any tools, although I think tools are more useful sometimes. And I'll be talking about uh, reducing communication in parallel graph computations. So um, just a short outline. I'm going to be talking about graphs, and I don't really need to remind you of graphs because half of this uh, workshop has been on graphs, and the other half has been on matrices. And I'll be talking about both of them, so it's good. Uh, but I'll be talking specifically about parallel graph computations. And I'll be talking about um, what is the determinant about a runtime of a parallel computation in, on graphs. And there will be the communication costs. And then I'll tell uh, why we care about linear algebra and how linear algebra en enables a lot of uh, scalable uh, graph computations. And I'll give a, a couple of examples. Uh, a new bread for search algorithm uh, in distributed memory, uh, sparse matrix matrix multiplication, which actually is useful for a lot of uh, graph computations, and uh, a dense graph uh, computation, finally, all pay shortest paths. And probably this is a redundant slide for this audience. Graphs have been used historically in computer science in many places, but uh, we now actually do more than that. Uh, what is more interesting is the graphs that um, are larger in scale than the previous use cases. And my particular focus is on scientific data sets where a lot of data, uh, biological, uh, chemical, cosmological, ecological, and astrophysics data can be modeled as graphs uh, where the entities are uh, vertices and interactions between entities uh, become the edges. And there, usually, there is very little limit about how big the, uh, the, the graphs get, because uh, the scientists are usually more interested in higher resolution uh, if you can provide the power to run uh, computations on them. Um, OK, so that's about computation. So what, is, uh, what determines how fast uh, an algorithm runs uh, beyond all notation, beyond uh, uh, what your textbook says, especially in um, there are two kinds of cost, and that's really not, nothing to do with parallel computations. It's the same for sequential computations as well, although more exac exacerbated in, the, uh, in parallel computations. So two computations. One of them is the flops, basically how many arithmetic operations you do. Um, and the second one is communication cost. How much does it cost to move data? And if it's a sequential computation, that really means how much does it take to move the data between DRAM and your registers and a computation device. And you can actually model this thing as a bunch of uh, simple alpha beta models. What they call is the gamma is the cost of a single flop, the number of flops times inverse bandwidth times the number of words moved, and a bunch of latency term. Uh, not that important, but even though we use this to analyze algorithms, what's more interesting here is what I'm trying to say is the cost of the flop term, um, top one, um, it's been increasing by a rate of 59% every year, improving uh, the, the gamma term, basically going down. And on the other hand, the communication cost, the, uh, the, the beta, the inverse bandwidth, is going down only by uh, 26%. And that's been going on for, uh, for a decade by now, and it's, uh, it can only get, uh, keep going this way or get worse. I don't think it's going to get any better than that. So that means the cost of uh, moving data is diverging and becoming exponentially more uh, uh, time consuming than actually doing arithmetic operations. So th therefore, our goal is going to be to develop faster algorithms by minimizing communication. And some of the, talk, uh, some of the examples, I'm going to try to do it to the lower bound possible. Some of them are just optimistic in the sense that we will optimize the common case as opposed to saying anything about worst case lower bound whatsoever. Another reason uh, for uh, minimizing communication is how much electricity it takes to actually do those things. And this is a, um, a figure by John Shelf, one of my coworkers. And on the y-axis, you see picojoules. And on the x-axis, you see um, the different uh, computations. Basically, one of them is a double precision floating point operation. And then it goes uh, all the way to what it takes to move data around in local interconnect and across the system. And the y-axis is log scale, so that's really important. And there you can see that the cost of actually moving data around across the system is two orders of magnitude more than at doing a double precision floating point operation in terms of energy. So avoiding communication actually saves energy as well. But this is probably you've seen this talk. Um, I mean, this has been pioneered by um, Jim Demmel, who's a professor here. Um, 
Jim, Jim is a, a great, uh, uh, I, would, I would say, uh, a very senior of mine and um, got me interested in this stuff. But there is a caveat in, uh, in what, uh, what I've been trying to do with, these, uh, uh, with communication avoiding idea. And that is uh, most of the stuff that's been uh, optimized in terms of communication has been matrix algebra, especially dense matrix algebra. And um, for graphs, that is not true. The dense, dense linear algebra has this property that we call surface to volume ratio, meaning that the uh, amount of computation you have to do is asymptotically more generally than the amount of uh, data reuse, the data that you need to touch or move. So that kind of creates this, what we call a weak scaling curve, a free lunch in a way. You get your problem bigger and the cost of doing uh, 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 comp uh, communication goes down naturally. Uh, that doesn't exist in graphs. That makes uh, minimizing communication in graphs uh, significantly more crucial. Uh, so this is a, just an example. Here what we do is we're doing a graph contraction, meaning that we get a graph and we uh, pick two uh, vertices and we contract it to a super vertex and we reestablish all the connections. And we do it, uh, this can be used for algebraic multigrid, the scientific method for solving systems of linear equations. And there we, we do this by sparse matrix matrix multiply and I'll tell you why. But the point here on this plot is just by using 4,000 cores, um, the percentage of time spent doing communication, meaning moving data around, is already 80%. So you don't really need to go to thousands, uh, uh, 10 thousands or 100 thousand cores to be dominated by communication. And this is because uh, the property of uh, graphs where the data reuse is pretty low. Uh, so, the, the quest to find reduced communication graph algorithms, um, we've been, we're going to be exploring matrices. Maybe, like David said, uh, you know, you can explain everything by matrices. Uh, maybe, not, maybe yes, maybe not. I'm not that religious. But here's, here's the benefit of doing these uh, by matrices. First of all, we know a lot about how to minimize communication in matrices, uh, thanks to prior work, so we can apply most of it to graphs, and I'll tell you some of them. And um, surprisingly, the set of matrix primitives that lets you write scalable graph algorithms is not huge. And th this is probably 80% uh, of all the things you would need. Um, multiplication of sparse matrices, sparse matrix, sparse vector multiplication, uh, arbitrary uh, MATLAB-like matrix indexing and element-wise operations. And all of those needs to be overloaded in a um, semi-ring as opposed to the using the regular uh, uh, times plus uh, ring. And why do we do that? Uh, if you look at uh, a textbook and try to write your graph algorithms in parallel using the textbook description, what happens is they become data-driven with unpredictable communication patterns and uh, all the uh, data access has become fine-grained. And people have tried that. They look at the breadth-first search implementation with a bunch of queue instructions, and only to find out six months later that there's actually no queue there because it's just a convenience way of describing it. Uh, there's much more parallelism than that textbook description is des describing. And that can be exploited in the level of linear algebra where the communication uh, patterns are fixed and the operations are on block, so you can reorder them and get more data reuse and the, the coarse-grained nature of linear algebra makes it more amenable to uh, bandwidth-bound computations as opposed to being limited by latency of fine-grained accesses. Just an example, uh, all of it has been uh, abstract. So here's how you do breadth-first search in the language of linear algebra, the simplest example. But you will be surprised to see that, uh, to see how many graph computations can be just uh, done by breadth-first search and doing a different uh, kind of breadth first search when you touch the data. So pretty much all of it boils down to breadth first search. So here we um, describe the, a graph, a seven uh, node, very famous graph. Uh, and it's a JSON matrix. I'll describe it in transpose form because column vectors look better than row vectors. Um, and I will start breadth first search from vertex number one. Simple, I put a, a sparse vector on the right with uh, only one of that. Uh, with only the first location non-zero, and it will have 
uh, its value as one as well, uh, whatever its index. And I do one uh, mul matrix vector multiply, except that for every multiplication, scalar multiplication, I'm just going to select uh, the second operand. It doesn't need to be whatever operand because this is actually, uh, this is Boolean. Uh, the, the matrix is Boolean. The, uh, the vector is integers. And for every addition, I'm going to be using minimum. And with one uh, run, what I discovered is exactly the first top neighbors, the four and two. And now I put them on the right hand side. I read, numbered them. I set the uh, indices to numbers, essentially. And I do it again. This time I'm going to be discovering the second top neighbors. And uh, if you think about it, if you want to think about it in graph terms, what it really does is the multiplication, scalar multiplication, traverses outgoing edges, and addition chooses among the incoming edges, um, multiple sources, and so on and so forth. So what we got is a deterministic width first search. And, and the only reason is because we made the addition operation minimum. We could have done it select randomly, and that would be a non-deterministic width first search. Doesn't matter. You can choose maximum. That's still correct. So that is how it goes. But I'm not here to tell you what width first search does. Here's a new algorithm. Um, before that, let's give a motivation about why we might need a new algorithm for breadth first search, which is already a linear time algorithm. And you can prove that you can't do better than that for a lot of graphs. But for some graphs, surprisingly, you can do better than that. You can do better than linear time, and that has nothing to do with sampling or providing error bounds. And all it means uh, is this is actually due to Scott Beamer, a graduate student at UC Berkeley. One day came to me with this exciting Thing. Oh, I just discovered this thing. And here's what's happening. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the profile of the execution on bread first search, on the left plot, I call each iteration a phase. And it really uh, starts too small because you're starting from a single node and it becomes all its neighbors and all of those neighbors. And soon around the fourth, fifth uh, iteration, you are at the peak of uh, your frontier, so-called frontier, and that's uh, been put on the y-axis, although some of it has been cut. The percentage of total execution time and the number of vertices, they're so close to each other, you don't even need to differentiate which one is what. So that is a good observation, except what you can do also is, among all those ex -exa ex edge examinations, how many of them are actually doing useful work? And you see that on that triangular-shaped uh, graph on the right, you see that only the ones with our dark uh, blue triangle is actually doing useful work. Everything else is doing redundant work and failing. So in a way, let me describe it this way. Uh, those guys on the, uh, those vertices on the front here are trying to claim children at the next level, right? But um, when the front here is too large and there's few vertices left to be claimed, everybody's trying to claim the same set of children and they're all failing. Uh, and those failures are the, the light blue parts, and there's also, also uh, there's the peers, as, sorry, these are the, uh, the yellow ones, and there are the peers, which are the edges in between vertices that are in the frontier. Both of them are redundant, and uh, you can actually get a small graph and verify that. I don't think I want to spend time on that. Uh, but how do you fix that? Um, again, I'm uh, advertising Scott's work, actually, here. You switch from going what's called a top-down red first search, uh, which really starts from the source and explores the whole, word, whole graph, uh, to something called a bottom-up search, meaning that you now uh, choose all the vertices that haven't been claimed, that are not being touched by the red first search, and you try to find back edges to the set of vertices that are in the frontier. And the, the benefit of this is as soon as you uh, find a valid edge to the frontier, you can break the loop and say, hey, I found someone. I don't need to disc uh, examine any other edge. So what this does is, um, it does a lot of things, first of all. Uh, in, at scale, it matters significantly. So we, uh, did, uh, I did work with Scott to do this in distributed memory, and so this plot is a huge uh, bread first search problem running on the Graph 500 uh, data set which is a benchmark for supercomputers. The x-axis is the scale of the problem, and which means um, two to do whatever that scale. And it goes as high as two to the 34 vertices. 
And um, this is a graph that has 16, uh, average degree 16. So you, you think about this, this is a quarter trillion edges on the, on the biggest side. And the, the number in the parentheses on the x-axis is the number of cores. And the search rate is on the x-axis. It's like a flops, but except that means billions of edges traversed. So what that does at the best case is 200, billions, uh, uh, 200 billion edges can be traversed using this algorithm compared to only 25 uh, that would, uh, you would get with a top-down algorithm. And, um, and where does that savings come from? Well, it's unsurprisingly, uh, it actually comes from the reduction in the amount of communication. So here, um, uh, this is of course, this algorithm will not work in every kind of graph. If you don't have an expansion property, and if you're exploring a two-dimensional grid breadth for search, the frontier never goes beyond a certain size, so it's not that interesting. But uh, if in most uh, real word graphs, there's an expansion property. So the, the degree distribution uh, gives that. And assuming that there's four bottom-up steps, which is very typical of these kind of graphs, you'll see at least a reduction of eight, factor of eight in the uh, number of words transferred, regardless of the, uh, the degree. And basically, these, these, these three plots are uh, with varying uh, density of the graph. But even the sparsest case, you'll see a reduction of a factor of eight. And of course, what does it do? It converts into, uh, I mean, this is another way of looking at it. This is actually real, real data. So we're talking about running uh, the breadth search on the Twitter data set that's, I guess, by 2009 has been collected and then pulled down because of some copyright claim. But whomever has it can still use it. That's my understanding. Uh, is this recorded? Sorry. Um, <laughs> No, uh, we're not really mining this data. This is totally anonymous for us. Um, if you look at it, the question, let's say you ask, uh, how, many, uh, how much resources do I need to do one breadth first search in 0.2 seconds? You can actually get that you can use 16 times less cores to run the same problem. And that's another way of looking at it. It's really nothing more exciting from the previous data. OK, that's all for a breadth first search. Now I'm going to talk about. Uh, something a little uh, harder to grasp, maybe, uh, and it's gonna be multiplication of two sparse matrices. Lots of applications, um, algebraic multi-grid graph clustering, I already told. I'm gonna now give you an example on between a centrality, but there's other stuff like cycle detection, quantum chemistry, so on, linear programming. Uh, we know a lot about dense matrix multiply. In fact, when I say jam, uh, half of the people know what it means, uh, it's, it's so common. Uh, it actually, for those of you who don't, it's generalized matrix multiplication. By the time uh, Fortran, back in the days where Fortran didn't have more than six letters for his uh, function names, that name stuck uh, as gem. And I'm gonna be calling matrix, uh, sparse matrix multiply as sparse gem. Uh, hopefully you won't get too offended. But we don't know a lot about sparse case. We know a lot about the dense case. We even know lower bounds that match the uh, and we have matching algorithms. For sparse case, there's a huge gap between the lower bound and what we know of. And um, it's really hard to prove a lower bound on a sparse algorithm because there's so many different sparse matrices, right? Therefore, we're gonna fix our matrices to be what's called an address random matrix. Uh, you know, uniformly random, you pick an edge by some probability. Um, and I'll, I'll actually first start with uh, the application, which is the between centrality very commonly used to find influential vertices, entities in a graph, uh, fairly expensive computationally, number of edges times the number of vertices if you do it directly. If you do an ap approximation, you still need to do lots of reference searches. So uh, definitely not linear. Um, so how do you do that? Um, the workhorse of doing this algorithm is really doing parallel breadth first searches from multiple starting vertices. Because at the end of the day, what uh, between a centrality needs to do is to find breadth first searches we call the forward phase, and then it does a tallying phase of counting, and it's a backwards breadth first search. And we can do lots of them in parallel to exploit more parallelism, and that's what we call multiple breadth first searches uh, from different starting vertices. 
you, we, I already showed you how to do wet first search using the language of linear algebra. It doesn't take a lot to guess that the multiple uh, starting vertex case is just changing the right-hand side vector to a matrix where each column is a starting vertex and you keep doing this thing. Um, the tolling is a little more interesting. The algebra changes, but the data access pattern doesn't change. It's still a matrix matrix product. Uh, the semi ring is different. Anyway, why do we do that? This actually gives, well, we can now optimize a single primitive and get over with a lot of problems. But there is also a, a nice thing about parallelism in there. By writing it in the language of linear algebra, I encapsulated all available levels of parallelism without even thinking about it. And it came to us a couple years later that what we did is we did parallelization over multiple bread first searches to the columns of B, and we did parallelization over all vertices in the frontier by using the inner dimension of the matrix, and we did parallelization over the adjacencies of each one of those frontier vertices to the rows of A transpose. And we didn't really need to think about that to do that. So that's the, the power of thinking in, in the uh, language of linear algebra, at least my personal view. Anyway, let's come to how to do this. Um, really, if you think about matrix multiplication, the amount of work is a cube, right? Uh, that's why it's n cube, right? Every single dot in that cube is a flop you need to do, arithmetic operation. In sparse case, this cube is sparsely populated, horribly sparsely populated to this point that it's almost empty, but still it's a cube. Uh, there are different kinds of algorithms in parallel you can do, and the nicest description we could come up with how to categorize them is how you parse up this cube. If you parse this uh, cube in terms of panels, it's a one-dimensional algorithm. If you uh, parse them in pencils, it's a two-dimensional algorithm. If you do little cube by little cube, it's a 3D algorithm. You will need to read the paper to actually understand what I'm talking about a little bit. But uh, how about sparse algorithms? We know all of this. This is for dense stuff. Um, we need to do one assumption to come up with any lower bound, and it is what we call a sparsity independence assumption. Here's why it's important. Uh, if I let the algorithm choose its data layout based on what entities in the output is non-zero, non there is no way I can come up with a lower bound. Uh, and no algorithm actually takes advantage of that anyway. Uh, before the algorithm starts, the algorithm knows whether it's gonna own the CIJ piece regardless of whether CIJ turns out to be non-zero or zero. That's the sparsity independence assumption. Once you do that assumption, oh, and the assumption that things are load balanced, you can come up with new algorithms that actually match a new lower bound using that independence assumption. And they're all three-dimensional algorithms. And here's, a, here's another way of looking at what's a three-dimensional algorithm. Uh, a standard, very famous algorithm due to uh, I think, I don't know who invented this, it's called sparse, it's called SUMA algorithm, a Scalable Universal Matrix Multiply. And um, it really works like uh, broadcasts and uh, panels of uh, things that you need to compute. It's like an outer product computation. Um, and the, there is a serialization uh, there. You need to do at least square root of P steps to finish that computation. And what you can do is you say, hey, I'm going to do all of these panels in parallel, and that's a 3D algorithm, and I'm going to finish with a reduction at the end. Uh, it, and there is, of course, all in between, what's what people call a two and a half D, which meaning that you can do two panels at the same time, followed by the other two panels. There, there is a whole spectrum of them. That's an important uh, still step in the sparse case as well. We're going to be exploiting that. And what it allows you to do is if you, if you do... Uh, this, this kind of creates a little bit of data replication for dense matrices, but it doesn't actually create you an asymptotic data increase in the sparse case. And that's because the output of a sparse matrix multiply is typically denser than the input. And replicating the input comes for free up to a certain limit. So that's actually a nice property. And uh, if you do this replication C times, you'll get a bandwidth reduction by a screw of C. But I said, that replication is actually asymptotically unimportant. 
uh, up to a factor of d, which is the density of your graph. And what does it give you? Um, this is a little convoluted slide. I'm going to use the simpler one, the, the, the performance of the iterative algorithm compared, iterative 3D algorithm compared to the 2D algorithm. And if you look at the rightmost point, it shows first um, the, the long column it's with the uh, number one. It says uh, the cost of uh, running a big sparse matrix matrix multiply on a power law graph. In fact, this is not a Adesh Renyu graph for real, uh, a real world uh, generator in a way. It's, it's not really a real world, but it's a synthetic generator that tries to imitate power law degree distribution. And that's the big column. And uh, if you go, uh, once you replicate 16 times in a, a 3D algorithm, you can get 2x faster if you're not careful. But if you carefully load balance the reductions, you can get five times faster. And, uh, and this is just actually uh, preliminary data. It can get better. And I'm going to finish off uh, with another uh, problem, maybe more interesting to some of you, because it's the workhorse of a famous uh, nonlinear dimensionality reduction algorithm called ISOMAP. It's called Ultra Short Spreads. So you, here the, the problem is a uh, graph again. And for all reachable pairs of vertices, you try to find the shortest path. Uh, the famous algorithm to do that is Floyd Warshall, uh, which really does successive order products. And um, you can reorder this computation, the inner loops, the outer loop. If you reorder, the algorithm breaks down because that's the induction sequence. But the trouble with Floyd Warshall is it doesn't have a lot of data reuse due to its outer product nature, one by one. Uh, what we found out is there's this uh, overlooked algorithm due to clean which does the same computation, but using a different schedule, we call it. And the pseudocode of it is on the right. I don't expect you to actually make sense of that pseudocode. The only thing you should make sense in that pseudocode is really this is rich in matrix multiplies. There's a lot of matrix multiplies, a bunch of recursive calls. And once again, semi-rings come in. For every plus, uh, uh, scalar addition, we're using the minimum operation. For every scalar multiplication, we're using the addition operation. So it's a matrix multiply on a semi-ring and with a bunch of recursive calls. And it goes on and on. You can find the paths as well. The crux is there are two things that will make this algorithm fast. One of them is the previous uh, crux, which is using three-dimensional algorithms for matrix multiplies. The other one is how to handle the recursion, because it's really hard to uh, handle the recursion and distribute memory efficiently. Uh, there is this question where sh when I'm taking a recursive step, my data is getting smaller. Do I let all my processes work on that smaller data, or do I let some of my processes go idle and uh, have only a subset of them run? And that changes the, the bounds in terms of the bandwidth versus latency. Uh, if you let everyone work on a really small data, you're bound by latency and you won't get the lower bound. But if you switch in the right place from what we call a cyclic to block step, as you will hit the lower bounds both in bandwidth and latency. And what you will be getting is, again, if you didn't do uh, the, the communication avoiding trick, you would be getting the performance of those blue uh, curves, which actually start to go down after a certain number of processes, uh, and similarly for different scales. And by just doing a replication of a factor of four, you get the yellow curve. By doing 16, you get the, uh, the red curve. So what this allows you to do is to strong scale a problem. Because as you strong scale the problem, increase the number of processes, keeping the data constant, you're getting more and more memory. And that allows you to do the replication. And in practice, you can solve a 65k vertex dense problem, which is the cubic problem, again, uh, in about two minutes on a supercomputer. And I, I believe that's actually an interesting result. And lots of people, including even the slides, uh, uh, have, collab uh, have uh, contributed to this work and as uh, Department of Energy funded this work in a way. Thank you. <laughs>